All right, good evening officially for those of you joining at home, and thank you for those of you that are here this evening. Please open your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8. I don't normally like wearing a tie, but today I'm wearing it because this afternoon we remembered uh, the life of a longtime member of our church, Ned Frazier. So let me open us in prayer by thanking God for him, praying for his family, and then we'll look together in Nehemiah 8, okay? God, thank you so much for stories I've heard from church family about a generation of folks who've spent their life serving you through Emmanuel Baptist Church. And as some of them are being called to their eternal rest in Christ, I thank you for the fruit of their ministry labor that we still enjoy today. Thank you, Lord, that we stand downstream of many men and women who have invested their lives in the gospel and done so here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I do pray for his sons today. I pray for Ben and for Ned Jr. pray for their wives, their children, their grandchildren. And I thank you, Lord, to hear really roundly from everyone who knew Ned that he knew Christ and We know that the greatest love is not our first love, but the love that first loved us. And it's in his name we thank you tonight. Amen. All right, so we're in Nehemiah 8, and I am more excited about this passage than all of the other ones we've done. All of the Bible's sweet, of course, but Nehemiah, remember, has been hostility, opposition, hostility, opposition. In fact, last week's title was The Night is Darkest Before the Dawn, but this week's title, Lesson 6 on the screen here, when rebuilding breaks into revival. So after seven chapters of difficulty, finally it breaks through. It's really, really good. So this is great hope for you, for me, for everyone who knows God and what that can mean in our life. So tonight the focus is really revival, God's way. And we'll see that from Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah 7 includes a lot of names that it might be entertaining for me to read. (laughs) I'm not going to read all of those, but mainly because Nehemiah 7 really is a summary chapter. Let me summarize it to you. In Nehemiah 7 verse 5, if you want to glance there, you could. Nehemiah says, God put on his heart something that was wise to do. And that was to consolidate the the city. At that point, at the end of chapter 6, the walls are built, but the people are spread out, which makes them vulnerable. So now... He consolidates them, but he consolidates them not just for military protection, but he actually consolidates them to convene them to hear from God's word. And that's when revival finally breaks out during this arduous rebuilding process. So a couple of reminders, convening, that's chapter 7. Nehemiah brings together God's people to stand for God's word. They have grown spiritually through the building of the wall. But now that that project is over, Nehemiah needs the people to rally around not just the protective work, but also the biblical truth that has been guiding them. One of the commentators I read on Nehemiah was talking about how many times churches in a a certain season of life have a project they're all working on. But when that project is over, then they're not sure what it is that they're all to be centered around. Sometimes it's a building project. I don't know if you've read this before, but it's a shocking percentage of pastors that when the building project is over, they, they're, they're done too. <laughs> so that can happen a lot if we forget what is the unifying center that we have. Nehemiah wants them to know the unifying center wasn't the rebuilding of the walls, but the word of God itself. And so now that the walls are built, they come together for the real reason that they've all been together. And I have that here on the bottom of the screen. The central thing has to always be more than the current project. It has to be the greatness of God. God's glory unites God's people around God's word, and that's true for any season of life. And so tonight we're in Nehemiah 8, and we're going to see revival break out here. And I want you to notice the qualities of revival. And if you're a note taker, there are going to be three, and they'll be the headings that are on the next couple slides. So revival God's way, here's the first one, part one. And I do think these steps are the normal way that God revives something. Part one, a desperate longing to hear and understand God's word. You're in Nehemiah 8. Let's look together in God's word in Nehemiah 8, verse 1, and then we can notice some things together. Verse 1, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who can understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. 
All right, first question for you. Feel free to answer out loud. Who wanted the Word of God brought? Who asked for the Word of God to be brought? The people. So the people were hungering to hear God's Word. They're asking for God's Word to be taught to them. Notice the text makes a big point of what percentage of the people are there. Did did you notice that? How many of them are there? They're all there. And in case you miss it, the text repeats it again. So the end of verse 2, men are there, women are there. Anybody who can understand is there. And they're all there. So everybody's eager. Now, that may seem like a small part to you. But it isn't small. Because in Acts, we read that when the church is together... The whole church is together. In other words, let me restate it. In American church, we're, we're used to churches having a certain percentage of the assembly gather. But that is not a normal thing in the Bible. In the Bible, God's people convene as one. In the Bible, God's people gather together. All of them do. And that's true in the Old Testament and the New. In the New Testament church, in fact, when the office of deacon is inaugurated in Acts 6, it says the whole number of all the disciples gathered, and they all participated in that important vote. So normally in Scripture, the whole body works together as one. So we see that here in verse 1 and 2. Now verse 3, And he, that is Ezra, read from it, facing the square before the water gate. There's a couple interesting things going on here that the original readers would would notice. This is not the normal place that you would read from God's Word. That would be the temple area. So why is he reading from the water gate? If we had a picture of the map, I would show you because that's the biggest place where the most people can, can gather. So the original reader would realize, whoa, this is like we had to go outside to the lawn because that many people showed up that day, you see? So everybody's there. And then he read from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So, so far in verse 3, what do you observe that shows the people's posture and desire to hear from the word of God, from the book of the law? What phrases do you notice that show that they really wanted to hear God's word? They stayed all morning. They let the crockpots overcook. (laughs) They stayed there that morning. That's right. What else do you see that showed they were really intrigued? They wanted to hear the word. Yes, yes, very good. Yeah, they're out there. It's not necessarily comfortable. Very good, very good. There's another phrase, too. I want to see if you see it. Very good. Their ears were attentive. So we all know the difference between listening and hearing, right? So these are people that actually want to hear. They're engaged. On the edge of their seat might be a phrase that we would use now. Now, it gets even better. And don't forget what we're talking about tonight from God's Word. This is what revival looks like when it breaks out. Verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. All right, let's freeze there. How else does this reveal that revival has broken out among God's people? Who built the pulpit? The people, the people say, we so desperately want to hear the word, we'll build the podium. You just get up there and preach it, and we want to sit under it and hear it. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, Mark Dever once, he was at a, one of those old Southern Baptist churches that we don't have up north. Up north, if you want to see a really beautiful church, you go to a Catholic church. Normally, those are the huge ornate ones, but I've noticed in the south, there are beautiful, huge ornate churches down south. When my wife and I were in Charleston, we went to First Baptist in Charleston, the oldest church, the oldest Baptist church in, in the South. And I've noticed some of the churches down here. Have you seen these? You have to climb a circle staircase to get up to the, the podium, the, the pulpit. Have you seen those before? Where the pulpit's way up, in, in, way up in the air. And many young people today, when they see that, they think it looks proud or, or self-serving. But, of course, the purpose was so people could hear, right? And that, that's the reason here as well, so that people can hear what he has to say. Can, notice Ezra doesn't make it an Ezra show. He wants to raise up other leaders. So beside him stood all these other names, and I'll let you pronounce them later. <laughs> now verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. Now, I don't want you to take anything for granted here. Point out some keys that you think are important for revival in what Ezra's doing. Feel free to state anything. You might think it's obvious. Good. Even their posture showed respect, reverence for what was happening. Good. 
something else, and don't ever overlook this. It's less common in churches in our country than you might think it is. Exactly. He opened the Bible in the sight of them. I, 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 trust me, that is rarer than you think. That is rarer than you think. Many churches, uh, even in my videos that I've been watching around the area, it is not uncommon for a pastor to open Harry Potter and pontificate on it. It is not uncommon for a pastor to open David McCollum 1776 and talk about that. It is not uncommon at all for ministers all over America to open a book other than the Bible. It is also not uncommon for ministers to have the Bible, but it's closed. <laughs> so all the other conversation is not actually about or from the Bible. So don't overlook that. It's very significant. So the people realize what he is saying is from the biblical text. Now, of course, it's a little bit of an anachronism to say open the book. He probably unrolled the scroll might be a better way to say it. But the idea is he is exposing God's word to them, and they recognize it as God's word, not as his own private thoughts. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Uh, verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. All right, what do you catch in this verse? That is integral and a great recognition that revival is breaking out. Yeah, they all. And notice their posture again. They were standing for the word. What are they doing now? Yeah, raising their hands and then bowing down their heads. So everything about them is responding in great praise. What else are they doing? So in verse 5, we saw the ministry of the word. What do we see here in verse 6? Very good. Praising God, blessing God, or we, or we might say prayer. So verse 5 is the reading of the word of God. Verse 6 is prayer to God. And notice it's prayer of praise, even as Jesus will look at this Sunday, Lord willing, begins the Lord's prayer with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So beginning with adoration. All right, now verse 7. Ezra brings other teachers along with him. Uh, many more names there, but notice verse 7, the end. This is very important. They helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So this is another key for revival. The people need to actually comprehend what the Word of God says. And other teachers are raised up to help make sure that happens. Today we might call them Sunday school teachers or something like that. So multiple people gifted and able to help explain the Word of God so that the whole body is bettered by it. And now verse 8 is one of my favorite definitions of expository preaching in the Bible. I wrote my dissertation on expository preaching, and many passages I spent significant time unpacking and researching. This is one of my favorites. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. All right, do you see how this is expository preaching? Expository preaching, let me uh, define it to the best of my ability. Mark Dever likes to say it this way. Expository preaching is when the point of the passage is the point of the sermon. That's a very good definition of it. There's one that I read uh, that I like a little bit better. It's when the vibe of the passage is the vibe of the sermon, because that includes even the tone of the passage itself. But don't overthink it. To exposit means to draw out. It's the opposite of eisegesis, which is to import in. So rather than the person speaking, giving their own opinions and pressing them into the Bible, the point of the person speaking is to simply be a messenger on God's behalf who exposes what the king who wrote it has to say. And it needs to be clearly understood so that the people can grasp what it means for them. Have you ever heard a Bible lesson that seemed like it would be a really cool history lesson for someone else? If you don't know what it means for you, it hasn't been expositive. So to expose it is to explain what God has said and what it means so that you can understand it. This is a wonderful, wonderful passage for us. And now we'll see how important that is for God to work revival in any place, including here. D.A. Carson writes, whether under the old covenant or the new, nothing is more important for the growth and maturation of God's people than a heart hungry to read and understand what God says and people to make it plain. Notice it is a both and. Uh, this, this is important. Never forget that preaching is in one sense a dialogue, even if only one person is publicly speaking. 
There is a sense in which the audience thirsts for the Word, and a sense in which the preacher loves to expose and explain the Word. And when those are true in harmony, revival breaks out. Williamson adds in his commentary on on, uh, Nehemiah, this paragraph shows the happy combination of a people eager to be taught and a teacher willing and able to meet their need. The people took the initiative. They invited Ezra, bring out the law. The whole community, verse 2 emphasizes, gathered to hear it. They anticipated the reading with a sense of reverent expectancy, as Mike pointed out. They stood, and they listened attentively throughout the lengthy exposition. It went from morning to midday, but they stayed. They persevered. As the sequel shows, such an attitude allows God's Word to have its maximum impact on the hearers. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit because I'm getting so, so excited. But not only does it go from morning to midday, but I'll just give away, it goes for seven days straight. So you've heard of revival services, right? People will plan a, a revival for a week here or a week here. But in Ezra, it just broke out on its own. The Spirit worked in such a way that the people made the calendar. We're not going home. We want to be here until we hear everything we need to hear. So it's, it's really a powerful recognition that the Spirit is doing something supernatural. So here's a principle for rebuilding. The priority and power of expository preaching and teaching is what drives and fuels rebuilding to revival. It happens from the pulpit. It happens in Sunday school classrooms. It happens in men's and women's studies. It happens in our homes when we're with our families and we're opening God's Word. But where we are eagerly coming to the Bible, Lord, I need what you have to say. Speak to me. Change me. Help me to humble myself under your Word. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture of revival. So part one is at the top, a desperate longing to hear and understand God's word. That's revival God's way. But now part two, the text gets even better. Part two, broken heartedness over sin, followed by amazing joy over God's grace. Nehemiah 8, now look in verse 9. This is really cool, by the way. Uh, Nehemiah, who was the instrumental guy in rebuilding the wall, is the kind of selfless leader who now happily steps aside so Ezra can explain the word. So it's wonderful how they're willing to recognize the different gifts of the body to accomplish the different things that need to be done. So in verse 9, Nehemiah, who is the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. You might be wondering, why did they weep? And the answer is because the law revealed their sinfulness. Here, Williamson writes this, The initial reaction is probably not to be explained by the fact that the law was unfamiliar to them, so much as that Ezra brought home its relevance to their situation in a fresh way. Therefore, parts of Scripture which have been thought to be out of date were shown to reveal the underlying principles of God's will, which were of timeless relevance. The result of this was to stir the people's consciences as they came to realize how far short of God's standards their lives had fallen. Now, this is one of the wonderful things the Bible promises it will do. Right after we read all Scripture is breathed out by God, we read that it's profitable to convict, to reprove, to rebuke, to instruct. In fact, we should expect that if there is a God, He wouldn't agree with us all the time, right? So the Word of God does a wonderful work when we understand it truly. It convicts, and we should never hate the convicting work of God because God does not use an axe to cut us down. He uses a precision scalpel to cut out what hurts us and to sew us up better for it. So the people here weep over their sin. By the way, the Word of God, when it's relevantly explained, always does this, always. If it's explained distantly, casually, uh, flippantly, then it, then it seems benign and it, it doesn't really mean very much. But when those soft, when those hard edges are not sanded, when they're allowed to be what they actually are, this is what it feels like to hear the word this way. So now let's keep going. Verse 10. And this is, this is so great. So they're crying because they realize how sinful they are, but notice how he responds. Verse 10. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat, drink sweet wine, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved. Why? 
For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So right after them crying over how sinful they are, he comes in and says, yes, you are, but this is how gracious God is. So don't be overly discouraged. Yes, be convicted. And chapter 9 will be about them confessing their sin. But more than being overwhelmed with despair, soar with gladness for the joy of the Lord as your strength. Verse 11. So the Levites calmed all the people. Uh, can, can you imagine that? The people are so brokenhearted that the ministers have to calm them down. That, that's a very rare thing. I have seen it a couple times, actually, though, where someone's preaching, and at the end of a service, one person comes to the altar, and then someone else comes down, and someone confesses a grievous sin to someone else, and someone apologizes to a sister in the church, and someone apologizes to the brother. I, I've been there. I've watched it happen. People across the auditorium, just brokenhearted, but in that tender moment, that's where God's ministers get to come in and say, but look at the cross and remember the grace of God and let the joy of the Lord be your strength. But you need that brokenness before you can enjoy that wonderful healing of God's grace. So the people are broken, and that's why they can then move to gladness. So verse 11, so the Levites calm them, saying, be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And notice now, verse 12, and all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they'd understood the words that were declared to them. The same words of the law that revealed God's perfect standards that broke their hearts are the same words of the law that revealed that there would be a Passover lamb, that there would be someone who would come that would fulfill God's promises to Abraham, that there would be a king who would fulfill God's promises to David. See, all of the things that expose their sin point greater to the Savior that they're anticipating, the Savior who we now know to be Jesus. So this wonderful text reminds us of part two of how revival happens. First, you want to hear the Bible. Then when you hear it, it cuts you like it's supposed to. But then it sews you back together better for it. So let's listen to um, another lengthy quote here. Well, I'll skip this one. It's a little long. So, revival God's way first, a desire to hear God's word. Second, a tender heart that then is revived by God's grace. And now third, searching scripture to joyfully obey the Lord. And this is how it always, always looks. First, God's word is what you desire. Then God's word convicts you and then encourages you. But then, when you receive the grace of God, then the next question is, how shall we then live? What do I do now with my life? And these are the remaining verses. So, look now in Nehemiah 8. Verse 13, on the second day, notice this is now day two of this revival meeting, the heads of fathers of houses of all people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. Don't miss that. Do you see what just happened? First they came and said, teach us the word. And now they're saying, we want to read the word on our own. You see? So it began with Ezra teaching it and explaining it and the other Levites helping. But now the people want to do that in their own life, in their own home. So the heads of the Father's houses, they want to study the words of the law too. And it gets even better here, verse 14. And they found written in the law that the Lord had commanded. Now at home, we're reading Second Chronicles right now. And one of the neat things that happens in the Old Testament, it happens fairly often. God's people have a good season, and then they have a really long sinful season. And then every once in a while, God will raise up a king, like Joash, who was seven, or uh, Josiah, who was eight, and then these Amaziah, who was 25. And then these young kings, what they often do is they find the Bible. <laughs> and then when they find the Bible, they read it, and they realize, whoa, God tells us what to do in here. And then they do it, and then they experience great blessing. And that's exactly what happens here. They find the Bible. And then in the Bible, they find out what God wants them to do. So verse 14, they found written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths. This is the Feast of Booths. You read about it all the way into the Gospels. But they hadn't done this for years. Nobody knew that this is what God wanted. So during the Feast of the Seventh Month, which it happens to be the seventh month. You remember that in verse 1? Verse 15, no coincidence there, by the way. That they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. And here's what the Bible said. Go out to the hills, bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So we want to do what the Bible says. Verse 16. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof. 
and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Jeshua the son of Nun to that day the people of Israel had not done so. So notice this had not been done for generations. But then they rediscovered in God's grace the Bible, a lamp unto their feet, a light unto their path, and it shaped everything for them. And notice how the verse ends then. And there was very great rejoicing. Don't miss that revival and rejoicing are hand in hand. So the revival comes with great joy. Verse 18, and day by day, from the first day to the last day, he just kept publicly reading the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. My childhood church growing up had a tradition they would do over New Year's Eve. They would ask people in the church, anyone who wanted to volunteer, to stand up and read the Bible. And they would read the Bible nonstop from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. And people would take shifts. You would read maybe six chapters or seven chapters. And it was really a neat thing because you could drop in any time over the couple days that it would take to do that. And people would just walk up to the podium and read their section. And then the next person would walk up and do the next section. And it was such a neat annual tradition to hear God's people read the Word of God and hear people sit and maybe hear it in a way they hadn't heard it before and hear God's Word together. And this is what they've done now for seven straight days. And in doing so, they're brought to great, great joy, which brings us to some other applications. Here is a key. Clear explanations of God's Word evoke both weeping over sin, because we're always far worse than we think we are, But it also evokes joyfulness over God's grace because God's grace is always far greater than we have any right to hope. Both are true. God's word will always expose like a mirror, as James says, that we are more sinful than we dared to believe we were. But praise God, it exposes even greater that God is more gracious than we have any right to hope that he would be to us. Both things have to happen. And let me show you that both happen in Hebrews 4. Here's Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, if the text ends there, all we would know is God reveals how sinful we are. And it's really painful. (laughs) And it cuts deeper than we would ever want someone to cut. But praise God, that's not where the text ends. Here's the continuing part of Hebrews 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, both have to happen. First, the text has to do the surgical cut to show you and me, yes, I am still more sinful than I want to admit. But then the text has to do the wonderful healing balm of Gilead. Here is how great Christ is, your high priest who is passed into the heavens who is able to empathize with every struggle you have and gives you reason to draw boldly with confidence to the throne of grace. So what happens in Nehemiah 8 is what always happens when we actually approach God's word as it truly is, the living word of God. And we present it seriously, not casually. And we unpack it and expose it rather than sort of glossing over it and being flippant or kind of scooting around it, but instead letting it do what only it can do. I love how God describes his own word in Jeremiah. Is not my word, says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rocks to pieces. So he breaks the heart of stone and makes it a heart of flesh. So here's a gut check question for all of us. And let's answer both of these in our own heart tonight. First, how has God been breaking your heart over sin? So if that's what the word of God does, since he said it's what it does, we should expect that God would be breaking our heart over our own sin. This is how revival happens. But secondly, and these two should always be two sides of the same coin. They should never be divided. Secondly, how has God 
been causing your heart to soar over his grace? So how has God been breaking your heart over your own sin? And then how has God been causing your heart to soar over his grace? We want to always be people who are able to weep. Much worse to not be able to weep. Think of how many people have read or had read to them the words of God and have never been moved. The Bible refers to this as hardness of heart. So the Bible is spoken, the Bible is preached, the Bible is read. Nothing registers, nothing changes, nothing is tenderized. That is a dangerous spot to be in. But what a blessing it is to hear the word of God and to be cut to the heart so that your heart can soar with the grace of Christ. So here's how it would encourage us to pray this evening. Let us pray for God to bring true revival to his people. And let us pray that it starts with us, even here at Emmanuel. And let us pray Nehemiah 8. This day is holy to the Lord your God, so do not mourn or weep, because all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And all the people went to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So let me pray for us, and then Crystal will give some updates about how we can pray for each other, and we'll share those with each other too. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Oh God, what a wonderful passage this is, and how badly I know I need it. How incredible it must have looked to see all of God's people standing together as one, men and women, old and young, all asking for the word of God to keep being read, and as hot tears stream down their faces, for them to be comforted by those speaking, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so, Lord, I pray that all across the world, surely in our country, and surely in our church, and surely in our own homes, and in our own lives, Lord, revive us again, so that we, like these people, come yearning to hear the words of God attentively, even the ones that hurt, even the ones that sting, because we know that those are actually words that are meant to heal, that they are given by the great physician who loves us and who only cuts to sow us better than we were before. So Lord, I thank you for passages that do expose our sin to us so that you can help us change and transform passages that bring out to us Like James says, a mirror reflecting things that we've been able to hide and deny about ourselves and maybe withhold from others, but then your word brings them to the light. And Lord, in those moments, help us to weep, but then help our tears to be wiped quickly by the grace of God when we look to the high priest who who can emphasize, empathize with our weakness, but then who has taken it and borne it on his body on the cross. And so we can approach the throne of grace and find mercy every time. Therefore, there's no sin that is too big or too great for Christ to take away and to forgive. And there's nothing that should cause us to feel so ashamed that we walk away from God. Instead, it should draw us to the throne of grace to find and experience fresh forgiveness. So, Lord, I pray for a revival. And I do pray that that revival, truly, Lord, across our country, may may pulpits just open the Bible (laughs) And just say what the Bible says. And then may the Spirit powerfully work through the Bible so that you can glorify your name. In Christ I pray. Amen. Uh, Thank you much. Thank you much. All right, Krista.